Become a member and add to the Resource Scholar social media community. Log on to ResourceScholarShow.com. I'm going to just be honest with you. All this seems like a lot of stuff in order to get work. Why, why would you, you know, it seems like what would make this attractive for the average person out here who, who's been on a job, who may be thinking about going into business. Uh, and, 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 you know, you, you've seen these projects come and go, and it seems like it's just so much trouble to get into this business thing. What, what, what would you say to the person on this particular project, uh, uh, why they should be uh, excited and interested in this project? So what, why they should be interested is infrastructure projects build community. And, um, and my, uh, entrepreneurship and jobs are the number one way to build wealth. They're the number one way. And um, if you want to build wealth, create a business, get a, get a piece of work, then you can expand your capacity. The difference between public sector work and private sector work is public is, is stable. This project is also a, a longer term project. And this is how this project will build wealth. So it's a longer term project, which provides stability to the company. Bill is going to give larger contracts, which over a longer period of time, which provides stability to the company that thereby provides stability to the workforce. And then in addition to that, the way that you build wealth for the company is then you tack on work related to another project. So why is that important? Because this is a DOT project. Most of the minority contractors in the metro area, we did a survey, over 70% have never done ODOT work. Why is that important? Because as a business owner, what you want to do is you want to get new services so that you can diversify your work and you want to compete in the market. And so what this does is it it's stable. You get ODOT work. Then you can go work on another project here, which is IBR, another WASHDOT ODOT project. What is and IBR? What is, what is IBR? Tell, tell us what IBR is. IBR stands for the Interstate Bridge Replacement Project. Up, 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 up north of uh, Portland going into Vancouver. Yes, it's, a, it's about 30, 20 minutes away, 30 minutes away from, from Portland. So that means companies can work on this project, get the skills, get the quals, work on this project for, you know, three, five years, then you can go jump to the IBR project. That is a 10-year project. 10-year project. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about um, uh, the value. First of all, let me just say that oftentimes we want to think about these programs of how they benefit people of color and minority communities and so forth. But in reality, it benefits the entire community because you have people who are who are working on these projects who otherwise might be doing some criminal activity or might not be, you know, not paying taxes. So this is a capacity building for the whole community, not just African Americans, other people of color. It's it's a way for building out a community that has great capacity that his uh, historically has not been you use to, uh, uh, you know, uh, build the tax space and build right. a, a positive community. So I just want people to get this is not all about just minority. This is the, for the whole health and welfare of the entire community. So let's talk about uh, that in, 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 in the sense of uh, workers. Um, mm -hmm. What's workers going to get? I mean, what, what's this mean for workers and the workforce and that kind of thing? 
Okay, so your point about, um, you know, addressing uh, uh, issues in the community, um, crime. So this, this, this program has high workforce goals, 14% female, 25% minority male. The, the, the data about who will those workers be by race will be disaggregated. So once we hire the workers, we will know who they are and what their race is so that the community can hold us accountable to achieving the black goals that they want. These are family wage jobs. Uh, the other thing is this will also include a, um, uh, a, a strategy to employ uh, formerly incarcerated individuals. So in this case, uh, the JV has hired a workforce advocate who um, it will be intentional about hiring uh, formerly incarcerated men and women. You mean the joint venture, the JV is yes. a joint venture, right? Yes. And, and they, they, all of the, the members of the joint venture will be included in this process to do that. That's right. And let me just say this, I'm going off script a little bit, but the construction industry as a whole is hurting. It benefits the whole, the entire construction industry is to get to maximize this training of new workers in the industry. And, uh, you know, if you just look around, you can just see there's a shortage of every uh, skill and craft. So. Really, they're working in their best interest to try to include people of color in this at this time, which, you know, we, we, we were headed toward a, a, a majority minority uh, country and we might as well face up to it. So now this investment is going in that direction. When you say I'm just asking that question. Yeah, I mean, so let me give you a couple stats. So black people in in Portland represent six percent of the population. And at the height of COVID, 11% of the black population in Portland were unemployed. So we need to utilize strategies like this to hire black individuals to blunt the effect of COVID. And we, we need to use other strategies like, uh, you know, ensuring that once they are on the job, that they are safe and that the, the, the job site is free of, of harassment and discrimination. And so in this case, we will have a cultural competency, zero tolerance on discrimination and hazing. Okay. So if, if, if I'm a minority contractor and an employee, what kind of resources and training can I look forward to if I get on this project, you know? We just take it for granted that these people who are, uh, I'm talking about the white guys are skilled, but they receive training ongoing on, on these projects. So tell us a little bit about the design training and resources, supports resources for anybody that gets on this project. Okay, so the other thing, uh, and for age, other agencies, they should use similar types of strategies, which is, uh, one of the RFPs that the project will be issuing is a request for a proposal from community-based organizations that serve uh, pre-apprenticeship apprenticeship programs in communities of color. And so they then will recruit pre-apprenticeships to help diversify the workforce. And so in other words, there will be assisting with building the pipeline, doing skill building, et cetera. But then the other thing is uh, the workforce advocate that will be working um, on the project, he will be doing assessments of individuals to then place them at different uh, on the project uh, uh, with different uh, companies. The other thing is they will get um, training and we will also be doing um, some kind of procurement related to the kinds of supports that are necessary for a worker to be successful. So like transportation, there some people will need uh, resources for transportation. They may need resources for childcare. 
Uh, if you're a woman, you know, a variety of things like that, wraparound services so that they can be successful in their job. Well, Emory, you know, this all sounds too good to be true. <laughs> this all sounds too good to be true. So, so tell me for real, let's keep it real. What are some of the challenges in pulling off something like this in our community? And, you know, just give us a give us the real deal on what it's going to take to make this stuff work for real. Timing. Um, everything has to be timed right. Um, OK, let me think about that. Let's yeah. see. While, while you're thinking, I was thinking uh, myself that we're working against many, many decades of discrimination yeah. and agencies. And I'm thinking of your, uh, your civil rights manager who just left there, who put together a, I thought a dynamite, uh, you know, plan on what they need to do to address some of these problems. And one of the things that as a person who works on these committees found out that changing the culture of ODOT itself, uh, to me, was going to be a barrier. So talk about a little bit about that. I'm just throwing some things out that maybe trigger your own ideas about what the barriers are, are going to be and what, what, what people are going to face, the agencies and our community in terms of trying to realize the goal of what this project is going to bring to us. Okay. All right. So, okay. I want to give my answer now because I agree. Um, So the challenges are, um, it really is like 40 years of discrimination in the market, D discrimination by ODOT itself, DBEs not wanting to work for ODOT because of the past discrimination, DBEs wanting to uh show up to, to bid on the work. In other words, we can have the best uh, specification. We have we can have the best prime, the best contractor, but we need DBEs to believe and and believe that that the the contractor is going to show up and support them. Which means the other thing is ODOT also needs to continuously change and improve the way they do business. They need to be faster in terms of, of the change, the change management that's occurring as a result of this project for ODOT is humongous. Now, is it keeping at pace uh, with, with the external consciousness um, following the George, George Floyd killing? Not as fast as we would like. Um, but those are just some of the things. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there is a, uh, you know, you're, you all are setting up high expectations for this project. I hope you know that. And uh, uh, I'm curious to know what kind of uh, systems or vehicles you have in place to ensure you all stay on track and there's an oversight to see that this, this stuff works. Tell, tell us a little bit about What's in place? So in terms of oversight, we have one of the best mechanisms, I think, for oversight, and that's the community. So we have, a, and again, this is one of the first, this is the first time ODOT has ever done this, which is we have a community oversight advisory committee for which basically everything that we do we'll go to the, we call it the COAC, Community Oversight Advisory Committee. Everything will go to the COAC from the specifications to who is selected, our strategies around outreach, it will all go to the COAC. And information will be um, transparent and disaggregated. And the other thing is we create a, uh, accountability tools for ourselves, like um, we created what we called a community matrix, which is, it's a tool to track input relative to the 
policy recommendations that they had to determine whether did we actually meet the community's intent. And so many of the things that we're talking about, James, or, you know, mini CMGC, technical assistance, la la la, directly came from the community. They wanted these things. It went into the spec and then the, the, um, the diversity director wrote it out based on his understanding of what he's been doing for 20 years. So let's be clear. How many jobs do you all anticipate uh, is going to be generated as a result of this Rose Quarter project? It's a, essentially it's 2 million, 2 million workforce hours or 150 million in, in payroll and benefits. It's a lot. What's the, what's the average um, hourly wage on these jobs you anticipate? I mean, I, you know, I, I know that I'm catching you off guard on that, but I think, you know, when we start talking about prevailing wage jobs, we're talking in the range of what, 25 to yep. Fifty dollars an hour, or something like that, right? It's like, uh, I think it's like twenty six dollars and forty one cents at the at the very low, low end. end. Uh, yep, very low end, and they can be significant on the high end. Seventy seventy dollars an hour, something like that. Seventy bucks an hour, eighty bucks an hour. Uh, that's that's well, really pick those jobs out. I might have to come out of retirement to get one of them seventy five dollars. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> I want to ask you. Uh, when will this, when will this, what's the earliest these jobs will be coming online, these projects will be coming online, and we can expect to see, uh, you know, uh, this thing really uh, hit the ground, breaking ground, as it were? Mm -hmm. Okay, so just so that the community has kind of a sense of the progression of the work. So over the next year, we will be bringing uh, – some of these mini CMGCs or, or DBEs to do some priming work. We're in pre-construction, pre now, into next year, 2022. And then in 2023, we will be issuing some of the main uh, work packages in 2023. So construction won't start until 2023. So again, the companies. Uh, the, the companies are, are the DBEs and then the workers or the workforce works for the companies. So the workforce will be on board 2023. However, um, the, we are doing some, some placements over the next year. And again, that's the reason why we're building the pipeline now, which is we'll be issuing the RFPs uh, to the community-based organizations next year. They will be helping to build the pipeline in terms of getting people skilled up for the jobs. We will be doing some placements on the job or on uh, with companies uh, over the next year, some, not a lot, some, and then um, because it's construction, think about all of the other ancillary contracts that will be involved. So there'll be many other opportunities like that too. So what I would say is uh, for those of you that are interested, I would watch the website. There will be many, many events coming up in 2022 where we have events with the community, where we have um, events with the contractors. And I would say to our young people, um, I really want young people of color and women to look at this as a way um, to build wealth. Because you can start out at 18 making, you know, $60,000 a year, as opposed to going to college and coming out of college with $100,000 in debt. And many people that go into the construction trades, they end up going to work in the construction trades, they get a retirement, they work for, you know, 20 years, they, they work, they get a retirement. And then oftentimes they then become, they in, then create their own company. And then they have a double retirement. Sometimes they do one trade and then they get a retirement and then they go into another trade and they get a second retirement. So this is, if I had known 
what I know now, I would have done that. That's a good, uh, that's a good uh, way of, uh, of approaching it. Well, you know, um, what kinds of jobs, you know, uh, can we anticipate early on? You know, and I, what I'm thinking of, there's always going to be the need for traffic control. Of course, that's always the area where they try to put minorities and so forth. But nevertheless, those are good paying jobs. And on the front end of a job, you're going to always have to have that. And uh, you can always diversify. One of the things, you know, I started out doing flagging and those kind of things my, myself. And uh, yeah. You get to, yeah, man, I had a, you know, I actually had a, a, a training um, a company that actually trained flaggers. You know, I did some of the things that, that once upon a time, mm -hmm. go back and ask some of the MoDOT guys who trained me way back when. Oh, they all dead. I forgot they're all dead now. They're all gone. But nevertheless, there's going to be uh, uh, opportunities, I think, for people in traffic control mm -hmm. and traffic management uh, kinds of a thing. So, um, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, so, um, I, would, I would suggest that we get a list of the front end jobs, you know, people that really want to be in, in construction or to get a CDL, for example, a commercial driver's license, which are going to be a lot of trucking opportunities, wouldn't you think? Oh, and yeah. Transporting equipment, um, that kind of thing, uh, uh, training on how to use a forklift and safety mm -hmm. and all those other things uh, that, that gives you the basic kind of training so you'll be in a, in a much more competitive position to try to do this work uh, if you follow what I'm saying. Does that make sense? And maybe you guys are come up with a list of those preliminary jobs that you look that that will help our community kind of get prepared for these jobs to come online. Right? Yeah, it's a great it's idea. Yeah, I mean, I'm always giving ideas. Y'all never pay no attention to what I say anyway. So I'll... <laughs> <laughs> that is not true, James. That is not true. But anyway. <laughs> but I mean, you're, you're right. There's, you know, we need drivers. We need operators. We need laborers. We need finishers. We need electricians, iron workers, carpenters, you name it. We're going to need it. You had to work in a team, bring others along, trust the folks that you were working with, discipline, work ethic, heart, passion. He always likes to press you to do more and to think bigger and to think broader. NAMAC nationally was stood up during the civil rights movement in Oakland, California. And this was really a revolt to some of the oppressive nature of working in union trades. James Posey started the Oregon chapter here in 1997 to stand up the narrative of businesses of color that for whatever reasons tend to not get opportunities on public and private projects in a fair and equitable way. Our businesses that literally were one truck, what James has been able to do over five decades is empower them to now being 60, 70, 80 million plus a year. The sacrifices James has made in our community stands out. He was never able to really build his business out because he was so minded on, for lack of a better word, ministry to his people and creating opportunities for his people. The fathers is the ones that dream the dreams, they're the ones that have the vision. But it's the young men that actually go and have to execute on that and to be overcomers. And I think James always understood that. He always understood the importance of youth and, and giving us opportunities to be able to grow and learn. There's a lot of people that had to go through a lot of things to be able to survive through Jim Crow, through segregation, through all the oppressive systems and policies. It's nothing like the time we stand in now to where equity's in the forefront, uh, social and economic justice is in the forefront.